Welcome to the first uh, video where we dive in deep into our Canyon corset, or our little course about rope systems for canyons. This is gonna dive deep into single ropes and static and releasable systems. And this video is going to be us diving deep into the weeds on this single topic. We're not gonna necessarily go deep into the brake test or how to tie these knots. Those are gonna be separate videos. We are gonna give you a ton of useful information if you ever plan on going down ropes in general, but specifically canyons because he does a lot of that. He also does other stuff. He's not just a canyon guy. <laughs> it's very important to understand this is a piece of a bigger project and you find all of that in the blog on hownotto.com where it's in order of how we want you to watch this. And then anything supplemental we add to this, that's where you're gonna find that. So what we have here is a figure eight on a carabiner and this is a single rope system that you can start any canyon with but you're not gonna get very far because your rope's stuck. Um, this is probably what cavers use where they plan on coming back up the rope. But you never go up stuff, you always go down. Is that correct? <laughs> For the most part, yeah. If you're doing it right, uh, we're going down <laughs> you're doing and right. we're gonna keep going down the canyon. That's kind of the whole point. Okay, so uh, this would be a single rope static system where it's not releasable up here. But this is clearly not what you would want to use. No, this has uh, clearly been rigged more than likely by a big wall climber that plays on a high line every now and then. Oh my gosh. All right. How would you do it, expert? So the first thing I'm going to do is run the end of the rope through the rappel ring because that's what it's there for. And then I'm going to put a knot system on a carabiner. In this case, a clove hitch. And now you can see this blocks against that rappel ring and gives me a static rope to rappel down. So I got one rope that is not releasable, it is static. By you, who's gonna stay up here while I rappel this. Exactly. You can't do anything about it while I'm on it. Correct, so if you have a problem, there's nothing I can do about it. Now in climbing, I don't typically have problems mid rappel. I guess you can get your hair stuck. There's a lot of things I guess could go wrong. But if you're going down a canyon, you could get into a waterfall and either get stuck under the water, in the water, upside down in the water. Mm -hmm. And that's where, if you're, especially if you're guiding new people, you want to be able to lower them to get out of that situation. Yeah, for sure. It's definitely something you want to consider if the environment changes. Um, I want to be able to lower that person as quickly as possible in those conditions. And then there's other benefits of being able to lower the rope. Like if I have an abrasion point, I can lower for that. I can't do that with this system or setting rope length. You and I did that in the canyon. It's interesting. Uh, we made a whole video about making sure you tie a knot at the end of your rope. And Prince like, yeah, that'll kill you. If, if you're trying to get off a rope and you're in a pond or the, the pool of water at the bottom after a rappel, he only sets and as a canyoneer, are you a canyoneer or a canyoning guy? Depends on what part of the country you're in. So you're, you're yeah. Southwest says it one way. Europe, they use canyoning. We use canyoning up here, but canyoneering was a term developed in the okay, Southwest. So you're a canyoneer. No, I'd be a canyoneer. A canyoneer. Or somebody that runs canyons. So somebody who runs canyons is going to just put just enough rope, just long enough. Whereas as a climber, I would throw the whole thing and say, rope. Yeah, we saw how well that went. Yeah, we did try that in the other video we did. So this means you have a whole bunch of rope up here. Yes. That you could use if you built a releasable system. Correct. To either creep the rope for abrasion or rescue me without having to come down there to me. Exactly. That's exactly what we call is that is a indirect rescue. I'm indirectly. But that's not what this is. This is nope. static. Nope. And without uh, extra equipment and additional training, there's nothing I can do about this. Now, this is retrievable, and that is one of many ways, I guess, to yep. do that. Yep. Is this a beaner block? So yes, this is any, any time that I have a carabiner in here, a lot of people refer to it as a carabiner block. Um, this is one I did with the clove hitch on the spine of the carabiner, blocks against the system. What Thank don't you like about this? So this in particular, if you load it quite a bit and it cinches down, it can be somewhat difficult to get this uh, off. Um, and that only becomes a little bit time consuming, you know, after you've retrieved your rope at the bottom, if your hands are cold, whatever the conditions are, I don't want to be fiddling with this more than I have to. And I definitely don't want to have the need to cut this off, especially since this is quite a bit 
uh, length of rope that I would have to cut. So uh, it does work. Other things you gotta be careful of is that some uh, very stiff, thick ropes don't set well. They're hard to tie uh, and there's some space on there. And then this can open up and start doing some weird stuff that you gotta be careful of. So anytime you do a clove hitch, they set better in a supple rope, but you wanna make sure that is set nice. So it either gets too tight or not tight at all. Right. Okay. So you gotta pay, you gotta pay attention to it. Uh, but this is fairly common. What is your favorite knot? I've been playing around with this one that is uh, similar to a stone knot you would do with a fiddle stick. Is this where I would stick my fiddle stick in there? Yep. Okay. Or with, with both strands. Um, what I'm careful with though is that when I do that is I have to clip both of these strands. The like back that. strands. Yep. Because when I did, <laughs> when I did this thinking I was a hot shot. Yeah, it looks good. <laughs> it lo <laughs> looks good until it's not. <laughs> Okay, so you have to clip both strands. Yep, there's a small video uh, in addition to this that will, you'll, you can see the details of how this is done. But what I found is in the testing that we've done is that I'm able to set this uh, very easily. I don't have to it, do it as, as tedious as a clove hitch. It worked well in stiff ropes, it worked well in supple ropes, and um, even to the point where we pulled it until the rope broke at mm -hmm. the knot, Mm -hmm. I was still able to easily get the carabiner out of this. So um, it's becoming a favorite of mine. We actually found it broke even higher. Not that you need it to break higher no. for a rappel. Breaking strength's not really the issue as much as like abrasion, but uh, it's way, way easier to untie. Yeah, for sure. And which is- which I see you use like it a lot. It. Yeah. yeah. What's um, the other way to do a, um, a carabiner block? So those are the two carabiner blocks I'm gonna go over now. Okay. Another type of block is just a knot block. Gotcha. So it's a simply, I'm gonna tie a knot and more, most That's common just one eight. is just a figure eight okay. on a bite. And there's a way that we do this. So you did not, you did not just clip the eye. Nope. So as a climber, I have seen the eye will be clipped and then this, so it can, if it got sucked through, the carabiner would stop it. Right. But a lot of people don't like this because if this knot, especially this size of a rope, could actually go into that ring enough to where I can't down here pull it out. Right. So you've just made this non-retrievable. Means like non-retrievable. Yeah, stuck. Non-retrievable. Okay, stuck. <laughs> uh, and you've seen um, a lot of your your pull tests that you can see the knot really deforms and deform. changes with a lot of force on it. Yeah. So that does two things. When you put a lot of force on it, it deforms the knot, allowing to slip farther through the ring, making it non-retrievable, but it also makes it extremely difficult to untie. Yeah. So that is why one of the techniques is by putting the carabiner through the knot and the end, it makes it easier to untie because when I remove that carabiner, there's space yeah, left yeah. in. Yep. And so now it's easier to untie. It also makes this object as large as possible to prevent anything from going through that ring. So it's a pretty good way to secure your rope. And it's also a way that is easy, easy to inspect and a lot of people already know how to tie this knot. Can I screw this up? I tend to, when I try stuff, it never goes as well as people make it look. If I clipped the middle of this knot in here, is there a huge problem with? From what I've seen, it's still gonna, it's still gonna work. You're just creating space in there that gotcha. getting the carabiner now. But the you, bottom two strands or it, the furthest strands away, yep. Yeah, it does seem like a natural thing to yep. clip. You do want to use a key nose carabiner. If it's yeah. a hook nose carabiner, it it down there, it could be very difficult to get that out. Yeah. So the one and only time I did something in the desert, <laughs> in a canyon, we used an, a fiddle stick. And that is not retrievable like this was, where you pull the other side of the rope down. You actually have a secondary string dyneema secondary paracord, whatever, that you can pull it out and the whole thing collapses and comes out. Is this still considered a single static system? Because the retrievable method is different. Correct, and that's the key difference between um, what we're calling releasable versus retrievable. This is retrievable, but releasable means, again, can I do anything about the rope length? Can I lower you from the anchor when it's weighted? So I cannot do that with this Unless I pull this <laughs> out, then it's extremely releasable very quickly. But um, I also found while I was on this with just one or two kilonewtons that you can't get the stick out. 
So it's not like you can just be like, throw something else on there, pop the stick. Right. So some of the hazards that do that do come into play is that when this gets turned sideways with some anchor systems, depending on how the ropes wrapped around a nat natural anchor, and then somebody starts to go on repel, this will happen. It'll slide down and just start getting knocked out. And then they get a very fast releasable system. Has that actually happened to the point where it's come out? Or is it just scared people when they actually see, oh my gosh, it almost happened? That's a good question. Because in my tests, I tried to recreate that with not that much force because I set up a high line on a fiddle stick to be funny and I was afraid of like, well, what if the high line was pushing down on it? There is a Canyon database of accidents and injuries that uh, we could probably look that up on. Okay. Not that you want to do that. Because I don't actually know. Yeah. I have seen people post pictures like He'll of post it scary... at, the, like it was, it was close enough. Was like close. one more tap, it would have gone. Okay. So the fact that it moved that far it, so, no, it, so it, it can move. Luck. Oh okay. yeah, pure okay. luck. And you gotta think because if you're put two kilonewtons on it, it's great. But when the rappel looks like this and I'm going down the hill, yeah, you're... it's like I'm off on, off on. This is moving around. And it's like every time there's less force on it, it's like, yep, yep, True. yep. And you're like, oh look, I made it down. If you're not free hanging rappelling, you're actually not putting very much force on. No. But this means you can take this Dyneema, which is what, 1 8th, 7 64th Dyneema, Yep. And you could wrap it around a thing, a rock, a carabiner, and you can go uh, pop. And then the whole thing falls apart. Now, that system means very little rope has to go around this in order to be exactly. come down. If this was a large uh, natural anchor, like a tree, and I didn't want to put a lot of rope damage on the tree, I can pull uh, less rope around it, have a short tail, and Fiddle me, baby. Oh boy. <laughs> and I want I want a significant amount of tail here for safety. Yeah, yeah. Right? Uh, I don't, like, why run? But for like two risk? for two meters to go around the tree is nothing. Whereas right. if you were to have, you you pull 30 meters around that thing. Yeah, and it's not uncommon. Like a lot of uh, canyon entrances, you got a three, 300, 200 foot rappel off a natural anchor to on that first pitch to get in. And then you move down the canyon. So that's where- So it's not just it. also for either a tree. If you had a rock, you wouldn't want to pull your rope around a rock abrading the crap out of it. Right. Or if you did what, a 300 foot rappel? Yep. Where, why did you choose this method for that? Well, one, I didn't want to pull 300 feet of rope all the way back up to the anchor. Rope. Yeah, because you still rope. have this little right. dynamic string. Yeah, so I don't want to pull all that uh, up, even though it was through a quick link. It's still a lot more work than pulling this and having that and having gravity do the work for me. So Brent put together this characteristics of rating system that you can, how to think and where to use certain things. So the single static, non-releasable system mm -hmm. there what's the pros and cons of this with your uh, efficiency ease of rigging abrasion and rescue so if we start breaking this down and i look at ease of rigging that was pretty easy yeah if you have team members that can recognize what i did that are familiar with it whether it's a clove hitch or any of the ones that, that we just saw here mm -hmm. um, it makes it very easy it's very fast everybody can identify it and check it so that's why i say it's ease of rigging yeah um, it's it's simple. It's, it's simple. not a lot going on here. This is a block system, so it means it's already it's ready to go. It's easy to retrieve as well. So that's so that's again pretty easy. You, Less work. I have you as the last person don't have to change anything to come down, other than make sure you have the tail with you. Right. But rescue. Yes. So rescue. Probably pretty low on the scale. <laughs> really low on the scale, unless I have a second rope ready to go or some other mechanism, uh, other devices to convert this. Uh, which requires more training and more equipment to so do. Ease of rescue up. is low. It doesn't mean you can't rescue. It doesn't mean you can't rescue. It's, it's just lower on my rating system. In abrasion, if I did have a rub point right here, you can't help me with that. I can't do anything about it until you're off the rope. Then I can adjust the rope length if it started to rub through. But so not while I'm on it. But not while you're on because it. Because a releasable system, you could, every couple meters I go down, you could release a couple inches, I'm mi mixing metrics again. And efficiency, not efficiency of setting up, not efficiency of pulling it down, but efficiency of getting groups down the canyon. So if you think about this, this is kind of a, a choke point. If I only have one strand of rope for people to progress on, I can only put one person down at a time. Now, if it's you and I, yeah, it, it's, it doesn't matter. We're yeah. not gonna be going at the same time unless we're doing a counterbalance system. But if I have eight people, it's gonna take an 
an exponential amount of time to move all eight people through. So, so I consider it low on the efficiency scale. So if the hangout spot is a little bit over there and each person's got to come over here carefully, get it all set up on their mm -hmm. system, test it, you got to make them feel comfortable, send them over the edge, get off the rope before yep. the next person can even start to put in their device. Correct. That sounds like I'd get cold. And you know, in Southwest Canyoning, you got you got time, you're enjoying the canyon, it's yeah. warm out, not a big deal. But when you're up here dealing with uh, the cold water- In the Pacific uh, Northwest. In yeah. the Pacific Northwest and uh, yeah, cause the water's super warm. Um, <laughs> we're concerned about hypothermia, people getting cold yeah. and uncomfortable. So progressing efficiently is pretty important to us. Yeah, I don't wanna rappel down there and wait an hour just to do the nope. next thing. Nope. Sounds boring if anything. It's really cold. So single releasable systems are next. Yeah, let's take a look at some of those. Okay. Oh, I'm stuck for it, rescue me. I can't. Why? You're on a static system. No. Brent, I'm stuck. I wrapped this around my hoodoo too many times. Help. I got you. Oh, is that one of those releasable systems? Yep. Oh God, that's scary. <laughs> Thanks bud. I got you, bro. Thank you. That was perfect. So this looks a little bit more fancy. What is this? This is just a Munger Mule overhand. And a lot of people are already familiar with um, the components of how to build this. It's a Munter with some tie offs so it doesn't slip through mm -hmm. if you're not hanging on to the tail. Correct. But you can untie it under load so you can start to use the munter. We'll yes. cover how to tie it in the video where we go into the depth of how you do each knot, but this goes through the ring still. Yep. Why? Um, so if I didn't put this through the ring and I threw down 100 feet of rope, yeah. um, I would have to pull that 100 feet back up to put through the ring because this is where I'm going to need to retrieve it. I need, The last person needs you something to repel from everybody else is repelling off this carabiner so this is why i refer to this as a direct system it's directly on the repel strand which means i need to change it in order to make it retrievable it's, so it's not it's, retrievable when you're coming down but correct. it is in the ring already correct so it's a little bit lower on the ease of rigging because of that because i have to change it so it's not as easy but it, as you saw it is pretty easy to rig once I know how to tie this knot. So it doesn't win a lot of awards and ease of rigging. Nope. And it's also not, I'd say almost not as efficient because you still obviously can't get more than one person down at a time. Right. And then you got to change it for you to even go down. Correct. But I bet rescues and abrasion are better with this. Yeah, absolutely. So if somebody's on the rope and it's weighted, I can start to untie the munter and now I can start lowering this person from the anchor. So if they have a problem, at least I can get them to the ground. Like not having enough rope. Correct. You can give me another couple feet. Yep. You could move that rub point so it doesn't rub on the same point at yep. the, the entire time I'm repelling. And if I get my hair stuck or I'm upside down in a waterfall, you can lower me until I can like get out of that. Correct. So it's definitely higher on the rescue, my rescue rating. And as you pointed out with the abrasion, it's higher on the abrasion scale. Now in the rescue, you're still not coming down to me. Nope. That would, you would need another rope or yep. a twin system or something, Correct. but but you can at least get me out of my problem if it's just because I'm stuck in the middle of this rappel. Right, so it's not the highest uh, that I would consider on the rescue scale. There, there are some, because like you said, I'm limited to one type of rescue and that's indirect. I can indirectly help you from the anchor, but at least I can do something. And I'm curious, do you really use this a lot if you don't have abrasion when you have just two or three experts going down a canyon? Oh, absolutely. This is one of the baseline techniques we teach to new people. So you would use this with your friends and not just in, in a guiding situation. Yep. What other releasable systems can you do with a single static? So the other one we're gonna look at is a type of block system. It's not system. a single static, it's a single releasable. It's a single uh, releasable. I'm getting this. So that was directly on the repel strand, which means I had to convert it. By building a system. This is looking familiar. This is what I saw. Yeah. By building the system on the opposite side of the repel ring and putting a device in here that is larger than the repel ring, just like the carabiner blocking techniques were. It's a figure eight blocking system. Yep. I'm essentially creating a blocking system. With a lot of wraps. Yep. So with the blocking system, I wanna be careful because if 
this strand ends up going down the strip. I don't want somebody repelling on the wrong side. And I want to secure the end of that figure eight uh, because I just taught, put a bite over it. So that's what this is here for, okay. is this is a backup, but it is a block system. You can see that figure eight is going definitely, against the repel ring. Definitely a block. So if I accidentally grab this strand or clip to this because I'm in a hurry and not paying attention and I'm like, that's my and, personal and, anchor, I go wham. And the anchor, <laughs> anchor manager is not paying attention you're not going to go for the for ride of your life. <laughs> right. So this is still single. Single. But releasable. Single releasable. So how does this releasable thing work? It looks complicated. So not as ease of rigging. Not as ease of rigging. But again, this is one that we teach to new it people. It doesn't look use. that hard, honestly. No. <laughs> okay. So um, how would this be released? We do use the fundamentals of a Munter mule overhand, except this is just a figure eight. So it's an eight and I muled, use a mule knot to secure this off, and then I did overhand to back it up. So we just call it an eight mule overhand. So you can release all of this while it's under load. Yep. And then start lowering you. And this definitely has more friction, I think, than the, yep. that munter you were using, yep. uh, which gives you more control. You can fix the abrasion issues. Yep. You have the same rescue value, yep. the indirect rescue, and it's still slow, still got one rope. Correct. One at a time. You're getting it. And the ease of rigging is, Super easy if you know what you're doing, just like rocket science. And as far as the uh, ease of rigging and efficiency, because it's a block system, all I have to do is remove this backup. You, as the last, last person, person, goes down, take my rope with me, and then ba -boom. I retrieve my rope. And so then you're moving down the canyon. And we're moving down the canyon. So efficiency is made up in the fact right. you've already pre-rigged your rappel. A little bit, little bit higher on the efficiency scale. And honestly, it doesn't take any more time to do that than that Munter Mule overhand. No, it doesn't. Um, where the Munter Mule overhand definitely gets used often uh, is when we go into unlinked bolts. This is a linked bolt situation. Because both bolts so are connected to right. this. So you got two bolts here that are different. These are unlinked anchors. Why would you see this in a canyon? What's the nickel to our answer for that? <laughs> <laughs> so uh, this is pretty common. You'll see up here in the Pacific Northwest because we have seasonal flooding and that happens every year. And it's pretty amazing if you can go and just peer into a canyon that you've run in August during the uh, seasonal rainstorm and see the significant difference of water that's going through there. So if you think that, like, why are these bolts so high? They could have been down here. And you're like, wait a minute, the water line's up there. So if there's a seasonal flood, this chattering in the water is going to get less damage than uh, like the chain anchor that was hanging in that chain getting rattled. The stick gets stuck in there. And, or a tree comes by no and crap. grabs. So I'm making the what can be grabbed a lot smaller so my bolts don't get damaged and I have to go in there and fix them every year. There's a lot that goes into bolting a canyon because the environment's changing. We're going to add all of this to the bolting Bible, have bolting videos about it. It's not what this is about, but if I don't have a linked system, how am I supposed to do all these things you just showed us? Because I can't just use one single ring. I've got to use two rings. Yeah, yeah. You definitely should be using uh, redundant anchors anytime you have the opportunity. And you Bol ask, Bolts are bomber, yeah. but it's best practice to be using two for any anchor. Yeah. So I've got two bolts. They're not connected. I don't want to leave material and make them connect. So I need to know how to rig to these. You don't yeah. want to leave material because if there's material, it could grab your, your tree. You're, you're getting All it. right. Get so it. leave them unlinked. Yep. Okay. Yeah. And you asked me, it's like, well, the MMO, why would I use the MMO over the EMO that we just, and this is an example of where the MMO is most commonly used for a lot of us is that the first thing I do when I step up here is link these two anchors. So now I have, a rated piece of equipment between these two. I'm going to pull this to an equalized point. Um, I do a girth hitch on here. Would you think that's super good enough, Ryan? Super good enough. We did do brake tests on it, but it has to be pretty ridiculously high too. Does this create some sort of redundancy with a girth hitch? If this were to get cut or break here, if one side fails or a bolt fails, it's going to be very difficult to slide through. So you do have some redundancy, especially if the bolt were to fail, you still have the carabiner and the ring attached to it. It's definitely not going to slip through. Right. Redundant and equalized-ish. Equalized enough. Yep. 
Not, not if the repeller moved from side to side. True. Right. But each bolt is 10 times more than the repeller is even putting on in strength. Correct. So uh, we actually pull tested this exact rig. You can check that out in the supplementary video stuff. So this is how I've now connected this and now I have an anchor point to start moving. This is where I'm gonna build my MMO. So I want to uh, run the rope through the rings. So you're still running it through the rings. Still running through the rings, but now I have an option. Do I start on this side or do I start on this side? Does it matter? Or no, oh. your bag's on this side. It depends. Where am I gonna be pulling the rope from? So if ah. I think, if I repel and I'm gonna be standing over there when I wanna retrieve my system, I want it to come back out. So I always start the side that I'm going to be pulling from. So I'm gonna start from this side and run through because it's gonna go back this way. So I'm gonna pull this out, pull enough rope down for the pitch. Just enough to get to the ground. That's a munter. Yeah, so there's a couple different ways you could tie the muncher. Either you clip it on, on the carabiner like you've seen, and we'll cover these in the videos, or I could do the air munter and clip, but I wanna make sure that it flips yeah. in the load side. So however, whatever method you, so, you choose. So you tie the munter. This is the side I'm repelling. Then mule it off, back it up with your overhand. MMO, munter mule overhand here. MMO, and now it's you can see a little bit more clear why it, we use the MMO and how often. Because in the example before this, stone carabiner block was so good compared to this, but this is why this exists. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So when you're all done, you can go clip, clip, clip. Now what? How do you come down? Because are you gonna come down a single, a single rope like we just did? Or are you gonna come down both strands like a climber? So that's a great question. And there's a couple different philosophies on it. So let's break this down and take a look. I don't want to leave any of this equipment here, so yeah. I'm obviously changing this rigging system. Obviously this comes out. So ease of rigging, a little bit lower. Is it as efficient? Not really sure, but I have a ring here that I can still build a blocking system on. So if it's the last person, I'm gonna remove all of my hardware and soft goods. You have to convert this. I have to convert it. Which means it's not as efficient. That doesn't necessarily mean it's not ease of rigging. It's just something no. extra to do. You can see how easy and fast that was. So now you can do your stone block here. So now I can do a blocking system. And now this is where it gets interesting. Is it still redundant? <laughs> yes. Yes, it is. If one blows, and if this side blows, now it's definitely not going to get stuck in there. Right. Why do people not think it's not redundant? Because I know that's the answer you wanted me to say. <laughs> um, so th there's a couple things you got to look at. So I have to make a choice and make sure I rig on the right repel strand because this starts looking a little different. So this is where you got to be wary anytime you're changing the anchor. It's very simple to make a mistake. Well, isn't this the rappel line? It. Exactly. And didn't and you want to pull it this way? Right. Okay. So checking your rigging. And because of the configuration change, it puts the last person at slightly higher risk. So there's a term that we'll call as last person at risk. And this is why. Anytime you reconfigure or whatnot, this is a possibility for error. So some people don't like- Possibility this. of error, not possibility of something breaking. Right. Versus the first person coming up, rigging their system. Now I have one system that I could send everybody down and it's been fully tested in theory. And then I don't have to do anything to change it as the last person. Nobody's checking your work if you have to switch something. Correct. So that's one issue. Now, as far as what's going on in the, in the, in the forces going on here, you wanna explain that? Yeah, so I have a feeling this isn't socially acceptable for everybody to go down. Because this is, this is coming from a guy who's broken bolts, broken ropes, and climbs. But maybe I don't know something. That's bomber. There are so many more ways to die going down this rope than something happening up here. So the thing is how, all right, if you accidentally do this strand, you could still put a backup of sorts. So you don't have the accidental thing going on. So we could solve that That's problem. the thing I don't like about this currently. Okay, so now we backed it up. So backed up enough. There's. Okay. There's sure. some carabiner cross loading that can happen, but not, I'm not too worried about the forces there. So what type of system is this, right? It's single, hold on, static. Single static. It's not releasable. Not releasable. And that's okay if that's all you're looking for, but if you, you just converted a releasable system, mm -hmm. and I no longer am releasable. So let's process through this. You've already seen how we did a static and releasable system on a single ring. Okay. 
how could I change this to get those same benefits? Oh, oh, this is fun. Can I make a block with this that would be releasable? I don't think so because whatever I end up doing here is gonna get jammed into this thing and not become releasable, is that correct? That is a really good way to think about it. Yes, you've seen people do it. If I have the opportunity to move the rigging away from it's not really possibly safe. pinning against a rock. And now we're gonna get into the discussion of bolt placement and where they, what were the options and is the rope pinning against the rock or whatnot. I need a so that's, that's also that why having that little Y hang type yeah. thing here. It gives me a lot of room to work with. Yeah, I lose a lot of gain and distance, but now I have a flexible point to work with. So you can see- if, if, if it's just you and me going down, would we just be able to do, and it's a low chance of me getting stuck in a waterfall, but you still want it releasable because you're yep. with me. Could you do it like we're trying to do it here? Yes. So, But if you're running eight people down a canyon, that's not what you're gonna want. If it was you and I, and I needed to set rope length, Yep. Um, I may not even fully secure this off, but I would be using it right away. Def exactly. I would yeah. definitely want to have a conversation with you and hey, Brian, I set the rope length short. I need you to set rope length. So I'm going to communicate with you how much more rope to give me. So I'm right. not repelling off the end of my rope prematurely. So I can do this. The right. forces on the anchors change marginally. Like is it not even worth discussing? Um, and then this is easily retrievable for the last person. I don't need to change anything. You don't have to change anything. Nope. Boom. Boom. And we're off and running. It just makes you repel on that string. Right. So I'm glad, I'm glad you asked about the, the eight pinning against the rock. So if there is some different, because rocks aren't flat, right? They're not this wall. If this does get pinned up in a way and gets jammed, then the releasable system I was counting on is not able to do its job. This is also one of the benefits of tying the EMO is that a lot of the knot stuff is down away from the eight and I can manipulate and move it around. So it really starts to limit the, what can get caught against the anchor. There are some other eight block systems that they refer to as an overhead lock where all of the rope is bound up against the eight. That doesn't look releasable. It, it is, and a lot, a lot of people still use this. Really popular Europe, uh, you can still see it in books, but it does have its problems. So that getting ja jammed up against the hardware or not, it can get a little bit more difficult. To because release. you could undo that, this, you could undo this under load, but you can't do it if it's pinched against the ring. Correct. So some, some things you can do to fix this is I can release this and try to pull it away from the anchor to get it to shift and like, yeah. okay, now, now that's not pinned and then, Try to try to get this to release at that point. Okay. But those are things you gotta be aware of. Gotcha. There's a couple caveats to this. Reasons why these bolts exist. There's the reasons they should and should not exist. And when you get into alpine canyoning, rope technique. Rope technique yes. These bolts might be in a very inconvenient location, so it doesn't the rope doesn't rub things. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but there also might be bolts in there that were not well thought through. So you gotta work with a lot of different scenarios. Yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people that are getting more educated on how to bolt, but really understanding the environment and what you're bolting for yeah. really makes a difference. And not just for that time and place in the canyon, but when it floods. Right, right. Can you imagine me bolting a sport wrap? No. I saw you climb. There, there'd, be, there'd be all these every three or four feet. We are gonna try to include uh, this information into the how not to sphere at some point, mm -hmm. but we're not trying to dive too deep into that. But I feel like I understand single static and releasable systems better and awesome. the different ways to retrieve it. I'm gonna add one more plug on. If you see on link bolts in a canyon, please do not put webbing and link these bolts don't link them. in the Pacific Northwest, especially. Please don't do it. The only link you should be worried about is the, the one in the description that leads to the blog about this where we are going to keep updating. When I hit publish on these videos, they're out there forever. I can't really change what's in here, but on the blog we can. New information, other resources that we're gonna be plugging and promoting. This is a core set. This is one piece of a bigger picture. If you're gonna go down a canyon, please don't watch this video and then go without somebody who knows what they're doing. This is just to help you understand what you're looking at when you go for the first time with an expert. Because when I went the first time with an expert, I didn't know anything I was seeing. And this would have been super helpful to watch. <laughs> 
for 20, 30 minutes before I went with you. Make sure you check out our next video, which will be the twin rope systems, which we'll probably break into two videos because there's isolated and compound and static and releasable, and it's it kind of fractures out a little bit, but uh, we're gonna keep breaking these into more and more videos until we have all the categories covered.